Good morning. Good morning, everyone in the sanctuary, and good morning to those at home. Um, we're going to uh, light our candles now to join us all as one. Asking God to come and be present with us today. Well, we're so thankful for the rain that came last Friday. We so needed it. And uh, we're ready for some more on our very dry lands as the ground and trees need that life spring, that water that brings the, um, that brings so we thirst for that living water of Jesus as well. We read in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. There's no craving more demanding than thirst. It's neither patient nor polite. When we get thirsty, we're usually quick to give in to its unrelenting demand. One way or another, thirst will not be denied. We'll do almost anything to satisfy our thirst. Because this is true, we join the psalmist in crying out, Jesus, intensify our thirst for you. Keep us panting, craving, longing like the deer, which pants its streams of water, the unpolluted, undistilled, never-ending brooks of your bounty. Later on in the service, we're going to sing a song that says, living water flowing through God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with that one desire. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that our eyes opened this morning, that we felt the floor beneath our feet, that we could see the beautiful sunrise on another gorgeous, colorful, sunny day of your creation. 
Forgive us, Lord, if our eyes were turned away from you this week. Help us to always look up towards you every day. Help us to see you when you walk beside us. Help us to lean on you when we're lost. We ask that you open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guiding. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. Jesus, the name above any other name, the only one who could ever save. You are worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. And we live for you, Lord. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up your eyes, open up our eyes in wonder and show us who you are today, Lord. And fill us with your heart and lead us in your love to those around us. We live for you. And we build our lives upon your love. It is our firm foundation. And we will put our trust in you alone. And we will not be shaken. O God of creation, you have blessed us with the changing of the seasons. As we welcome the autumn months, may the earlier setting sun remind us to take time to rest. May the brilliant colors of the leaves remind us of the wonder of your creation. May the steam of our breath in the cool air remind us that it is you who gives us the breath of life. May the harvest from the fields remind us of the abundance we have been given and bounty we are to share with others. May the dying of the summer spirit remind us of your great promise that death is temporary and life is eternal with you. We praise you for your goodness forever and ever. We pray all this and dedicate this service in your precious and holy name. And we pray the prayer that you taught us, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join us in standing as we sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we keep for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. 
Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is
pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Lord. great are you Lord. thank you please be seated couple of uh, morning morning just a couple of quick announcements uh for you this morning we will be having coffee this wednesday uh we weren't able to do that last week with the bc hydro cuts um but um we will be doing that this wednesday so looking forward to that um this wednesday morning uh the end of the service last sunday uh nicole came forward uh for a prayer request for lachlan she is and uh really good news came through this week that he had had his spinal tap and everything's clear so praise god um keep lachlan and his family uh in your prayers but that's a huge a huge answer to prayer this past week um but at the same time we also got a call this week so wheezy grobler um louise's mum, uh who has been um well she's been dealing with some treatment for some time um Things are not great with Wheezy right now. And so we just want to lift her up in our prayers. And, uh, and I think Nicola will be uh, mentioning that when we get to the prayers of the people today. Um, so her son is in from Australia. Um, but yeah, Wheezy's not, not doing well at this point in time. So this just remember Wheezy and Louisa and Gerhard and the entire family um, in these next days, weeks um, that lie ahead for them. Uh, we released the Christmas boxes last week. I hope some of you have had some fun filling them. I know Andrew's definitely had some fun uh, because he went to actually fill his uh, shoe box and then ended up buying himself a packet of love hearts. Hands up who got one. Oh, I'll put my hand down because I didn't get one. Uh, so uh, that's okay, Andrew. Bucks to me, me, I guess. Um, so, but I'm hoping you're really enjoying. I know I did. Um, I took the girls. Um, they had another day off school this week. Uh, so <laughs> these teachers. And uh, so uh, we got our boxes filled on Friday. And it's a lot of fun. And just thinking, trying to imagine um, who might actually receive this. And, uh, you know, and just thinking after you've filled it and that image of giving it a hug and thinking this is my love shared with that child that I'll perhaps never meet, um, the likelihood of ever meeting one of those children uh, personally is slim. But I, I hope that um, you will fill the boxes. If we need more, we'll get more. Uh, we'll look forward to that. But what do you put in them? What should you, what shouldn't you put in them? So uh, this is our opportunity to actually show, show one of the videos that will actually hopefully give us a little bit of help with that. So Owen, over to you. Now let's pack those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. If you're like me, it can be difficult to know where to start. To make things easier, just start with a box. Any average size cardboard or plastic box will work, but I find a shoe box works best. After that, you'll need to decide what age group you're gonna pack for, and if it's for a boy or a girl. Now let's fill that shoe box. It's best to start by selecting a wow item. Something like a soccer ball and a pump, or a stuffed animal, something really special. <laughs> yes and yes. Once you've got your wow item, you can start to fill it with other fun stuff like toys, clothes, sandals, or even school supplies. <laughs> what do you mean, however? However, there are some things you don't want to include. Things like gum, toothpaste, items related to war, liquids. But for a complete list, check out the website. Oh boy, I think they're gonna like this. While a shoebox might seem small and simple, it can mean the world to a child who may have never received a gift. It shows God's love in a tangible way to children in need, and together with the local church worldwide, shares the good news of Jesus Christ. This is why you will also want to personalize your shoebox. Even including a letter or a photo of your family or yourself can make it extra special to the child. 
the most powerful thing you can do is pray. Pray that your gift will make an impact. That both the child and the community will discover the love and name of Jesus. When your box is finished, you can make your $10 donation online or by mailing in your contribution using the business reply envelope in the brochure. This donation is critical for training and equipping local churches to share the gospel, along with the collection, processing, and shipping of the shoebox gifts. And don't forget to activate a label so you can follow your box and discover its final destination. Finally, make sure to check the website for the closest drop-off location near you. And make sure to mark the date for the third week in November as National Collection Week. Well, there you go. You just packed yourself a shoebox. <laughs> Grandma. Already done. What? How? I thought she wasn't going to stores right now. She isn't. She packed her box online. That's right, Dad. With just a few clicks of a mouse, Grandma packed her whole shoebox online. She can choose from all kinds of gifts, even make it personal by adding a letter and a photo. Wow. So she doesn't even need to leave the house? Nope, she can stay safe inside and still have time for Doomcraft. Docking complete. Unbelievable. So I hope you kind of caught no, no cans, no aerosols, no liquids of any kind, no toothpaste, but definitely a toothbrush, no weapons uh, of mass destruction or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, no guns, bows, or anything like that. So, uh, but there's really good information on the website to to double check on that to make sure you uh, put in um, some really good things. The wow item of a soccer ball. Tried that last year, and uh, it's really hard to get a soccer ball deflated and get it small enough to get anything else in the box. So, um, uh, tennis balls, things little little small kind of uh, balls actually would be really good. Um, for kids so uh, hopefully we will continue to enjoy filling the boxes and once you do start bringing them in get them up the front and uh, in a few weeks time then we'll get them shipped off to North Shore Alliance Church which is the our local distribution uh, depot here in North Van. That's all of the announcements for today and let's uh, stand again and, and sing. George is eating his breakfast. Just ignore him. <laughs> Open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring. Lift it high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice, I will bring a sacrifice, I lay me down, I'm not my own, I belong to Be 
sing my joy to sing your will your way it will be my joy to sing your will your way Good morning, church family. I'm Nicola Walton Knight, and I'm one of the elders here at SAS. I'm just going to catch my breath. Isn't it wonderful to be back singing together in the sanctuary? Yes. Um, and on that theme, there's a song I've heard recently by Katie Nichol that has really resonated with me. The first line says, I speak the name of Jesus over you. The song talks of the power in the name Jesus, the authority that comes through proclaiming Jesus. The Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, that demons will flee. So for our prayers today, I've chosen a few of Jesus and God the Father's names that we hear in the Bible to guide our prayers. At the end of each prayer, as I say, we pray with power, please respond in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Jesus, light of the world. Jesus, you were so determined to draw us into the light that you spent nine months in the darkness of Mary's womb in order to be one of us and to bring us light. We desire to live and walk in your light and to reflect your light to the world around us. When we are shrouded in darkness, we cannot see the path ahead. We get lost. We trip up. We lose our focus. We no longer know what is right or what is wrong. The darkness penetrates our thoughts our actions and our relationships. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Lord, we cry out today for your light. Your light pushes out the darkness of sorrow, the darkness of desperation, the darkness of brokenness and the darkness of fear. Your light brings truth, clarity, direction. It exposes the lies. Lord, we pray that your light will flood into every corner of our hearts and lives. Cast out the shadows and revive and restore us to be your light-filled people. May we declare to the world that it is possible to see clearly, to see the way ahead, and to live in the beauty of your light. We pray with power in the name of Jesus. Father, you are Shofet, our judge. You judge in righteousness. You defend the fatherless. You hold men accountable for their thoughts and actions. And yet you are perfectly merciful through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We bring before you the turmoil we see in the world brought about by human injustice, 
desires of the selfish human heart for power, wealth, and prestige. We pray for good governance, for honesty, for truth to be heard, and for integrity. We remember places caught up in war for Ukraine. We remember countries in social turmoil due to inequality and oppression, Iran and Pakistan. We lift before you so many democratic countries that have recently undergone political change, some smooth and some tumultuous. We think of Italy, we think of the UK. And for our own province, as new local governments start work, bless their work with compassion, perspective and humility that our local communities will be places that love justice, show mercy and walk humbly in your way. We pray with power in the name of Jesus. Father, our provider, Jehovah Jireh. Father, you provided a ram for Abraham to sacrifice instead of Isaac, his son. And so within that act, we see you as a God that provides not only for our physical needs, but our emotional and relational needs too. In the quiet of our hearts, may I encourage us to be courageous and to bring before God now, whatever your needs may be. Maybe they're financial. Maybe there's issues in work or lack of work. Maybe we need to seek forgiveness or repentance for restoration of relationships, to find peace over an emotional pain. Maybe we ask God to guide us to make a decision Jehovah Jireh, you asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, knowing that you would provide for him. Thank you for providing Jesus for us, and in so doing, providing all that we could ever need beyond our imagining. We pray with power in the name of Jesus. Father, you are the Lord who heals. Jehovah Rophe. You heal, restore, and make whole, and through Jesus, the great physician, heal body and soul. We pray today for our struggling healthcare system. After two years of pandemic and acute staff shortages, wait times, and burnout. Restore those feeling exhausted and unable to carry on. Give strength to those working long hours and emotional capacity to continue to care in the face of human suffering. We pray for those needing care, waiting in emergency rooms, waiting in corridors, waiting for long-term care placements or for home support or for long-awaited surgery. Give them peace and assurance that they have not been forgotten and may they find joy in small daily moments that can keep their spirits lifted. We especially remember today the family of Jesse McCready as they grieve. We remember those in need of physical healing and for strength. Louise Grobler, Jeanette Calder, Una Wood, Louise Reynard, Janice Darlington, Ron Edwards, Liz Lilly, Lorne Dennis, Kel Kaiser, and Penny McDonald. We remember those who live in long-term care centers for Margaret Williams, Don Campbell, Alan Bone, Joanne Graham, 
Dean Scott and Helen Arnett. We pray with power in the name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is Joshua 5, verse 13 to 6, verse 27. The fall of Jericho. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him and a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the Ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests, carrying the seven trumpets, went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that it is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought her out. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. 
Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. This is the word of the Lord. You are not alone If you are lonely When you feel afraid You're not the only We are all the same In need of mercy To be forgiven and be free it's all you got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, 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 oh. and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you'll reach your home, well, it's the man. We are strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken, we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and we fall. And He so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us all. And all the people said Amen. Oh, 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 oh. and all the people said Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends, and all the people said Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who were torn apart. Blessed are all the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are all the people hungry for another star. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. All the people said amen. Whoa, 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 and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Whoa, 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 and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love never ends. And all the people said Amen. And all the people said Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Please, Alan Yang, uh, one of my colleagues who died in the line of duty uh, last week. And uh, I know that the communities all around the Lower Mainland have been thinking about her and praying for her and her family over the last few days. Um, and I'd just like to take this moment in the Lord's house to mention her name and bring her name forward and that you would all uh, consider her and add her and her family to your prayers over this next little while. Thank you very much. Amen, Gord, amen. Let's just take a moment in prayer. Let's pray.
Father God, so much hurt is felt in so many families right now, all the way around the world. Because someone else has caused that hurt. Someone else created to be a giver and provider of life, a brother and a sister's keeper has taken life from another. Lord, we do think of Shailen's family right now, the whole community and all of her colleagues. We think of everything that's going on in the lower mainland right now. Lives that are being taken unnecessarily. Nicola just reminded us in our prayers that you are the God who provides. Pray right now that you would provide blessing, comfort, strength, courage. Shailen's family, community, her colleagues, those in leadership. We pray for the new mayor of Vancouver. We undoubtedly will be trying everything to clean up a lot of what's been going on in this city. We live in perhaps the most beautiful city in the world. We like to think of it. And yet there is so much darkness. And Lord, now we open our minds to this story, a story where there is so much darkness. And yet there's also light. So speak, meet us as we gather round the walls of Jericho. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, for the past two weeks, uh, we've been focusing on Moses, on Moses' story, the beginning when he was called on to the way of Jesus, as I've been kind of referring to it. And then last week, we looked at his final speech to God's people, preparing them to walk the way of Jesus after they crossed the Jordan and start taking possession of what we call the promised land. Well, today we've just uh, read uh, the most well-known story, perhaps, in, in, in Joshua's a uh, kind of leading the people of Israel happens right after they cross the Jordan. I'm sure some of you grew up uh, being taught that little kitty song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. We should have done that, shouldn't we? Like, just got us going. I, I love the story of Joshua and Jericho. And I think it is one of those stories, if I was ever to write a book, uh, about being on the Jesus way. This would be one of my first chapters that I would definitely include in the book. So the question is why? Uh, and, and, and really that question, uh, in what the question has been on my heart this week and preparing for this Sunday is what can we uh, in our day and age learn from this story that might help us walk the Jesus way better? So what can we learn from this story to help us walk the Jesus way better? Reality is, though, before we can learn anything from this story, we first have to deal with the unpleasantness that is in the story. Verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. And they devoted the city to Yahweh and destroyed with the sword every living thing within its walls. 
man, woman, children, elderly, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. What do we do with that? And what do we do with the fact that this is actually just the first of many, many stories about Israel conquering the promised land, laying waste to the people who were previously living in those areas? I said to someone this past week in passing that this story is hard enough to hear and to teach no matter where you might be in the world, but to teach it in Canada, in a culture that is so aware right now of the atrocities that occurred to indigenous people within these lands when the Europeans first came to this land. And a lot of what was done in those days gone by was done in the name of the Lord. Quite frankly, it makes the story of Jericho seem like an abomination that we should just completely disregard. So the first, first thing we need to note about the story is how it was introduced. Sandy read for us, verse 13, uh, these verses, 13 to 15, these verses of chapter 5, which act as an introduction not merely to the story of Jericho, but everything that is going to unfold now throughout the entire book of Joshua. So I'd like to reread a little bit of that introduction. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up, he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. So clearly this figure is some sort of a military figure, or to be more accurate, his drawn sword symbolizes judgment is imminent. Judgment is imminent. Joshua goes up to the man and asks, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Don't miss the question. Don't just read over it. It's a key question being asked at the book of Joshua. Joshua is basically asking, which side are you on in this fight that now lies before us in this uh, land? But the person replies, neither. I'm not for you, nor am I against you. But as commander of the army of the Lord, that's why I have now come. I am not here to be for you or against you. I'm here to do the work of Yahweh, to do Yahweh's will. So let's emphasize that a little more. The person symbolizing judgment right at the introduction of this key story has come to instigate the will of the Father in heaven. Now that raises several more questions because now we are faced in the story with the old vision of God from the Old Testament that he is indeed a wrathful, judgmental God. Well, just a couple of quick comments about that because I really do want us to get to the actual story of Jericho. The inhabitants in Jericho, namely the Canaanites, are among the nations that we uh, were previously listed in Moses' uh, writings in Deuteronomy, where God says to Moses, you must destroy them totally. So Moses is preparing the people to go into the promised land, and it's clear in the law, it says you must destroy them completely. Sounds pretty clear what they have to do, right? But immediately after God telling Moses that, God then says this to Moses, make no treaty with them, show them no mercy, do not intermarry with them, do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Now, if, the, if they had completely destroyed everyone as they were told to do, why would there be any need to instruct Israel about not making treaties with them or not intermarrying with them. Sounds a bit confusing, but the point of all of this is there's probably some exaggeration going on in the story. When a battle is won, <clears throat> it's common to say something like, 
Well, we completely destroyed them. Yeah, you, you defeated them. Doesn't mean that you have killed every single person on the other side. No, it doesn't. So we're not talking about some kind of genocide happening here when Israel crosses into the promised land. However, there is an incredible emphasis of so much death. And that is symbolic. There is an emphasis of so much death, which is symbolic. Killing all the people named the men, the women, the young, the old, the cattle, the sheep, the donkeys. Why this emphasis on death and destruction? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we get told that these people, these inhabitants, sacrifice their own children to their gods. You don't need me to tell you that that's something detestable to Yahweh. The point then is that there are some practices within the inhabitants on the, in the land within Jericho that God is utterly opposed to. There is an evil that is rife within Canaan. A darkness, in other words, to use the language that Nicola has kind of introduced to us today. There's a darkness in the land, a darkness in the city that needs light. So does God just show up then and judge them for the evil that is in their midst? Like, surely we would expect him to show some mercy to these people. Think about the story. Israel is told, march around Jericho once a day for a period of six days. And then march around the city seven times on the seventh day. The number seven in the story, I'm sure you heard it repeated over and over and over and over again. It's a very key number because it corresponds to the number of creation. It's really a number in the, in the Bible that uh, symbolizes completion. We might call it God's will. God grants Jericho a complete period of time to repent. For Jericho to not live in opposition to his way, to use that language, but embrace his way, his will. But they chose not to. So eventually, in God's time, a shout was raised and judgment of evil came. And it's important to note it that way. God wants to rid the evil from the promised land. The story of Jericho is not a story about one nation against another nation, Israel v. the Canaanites. The story is about Yahweh coming in and ridding the land of evil. Think back to all the stories that we read in Genesis chapter 3 to 11. It's the same idea. Evil has flooded the land, and God wants to rid it of that evil. Now, I know that's a very quick brushstroke of some very difficult subjects raised by this Jericho story, but I want us to get to the main question today. What is it that we possibly could learn from Jericho that might help us walk the way better. And for that, for the remainder of this time together, I want to highlight, guess what? Seven factors. It had to be seven today. Seven factors that we learn about walking the way of Jesus from this story. Number one, no surprise, we must begin with complete obedience to the word of God. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Joshua is told, keep this book of the Torah always on your lips, always in your mind. Meditate on this word day and night so that you will be careful to do everything that is written within it. Then you will, pros you will be prosperous and successful. Then you will be full of life. Moses was told this, the rebuilding of Israel depended upon this, and now the move into the promised land also depends on Israel's obedience to God's word. Walking the way of Jesus depends upon obedience to God's word. Factor number two, 
connected with the first, Joshua was told, march around Jericho with the Ark, the covenant. The Ark symbolized God's presence in the midst of God's people. And God's presence was to go with them. In fact, it was to go before them. They were to follow it. God was to lead them. What's more, the armed guard were to surround the ark. Why? They are to protect it. Symbolically, what's going on is it's not about the armed guard protecting the people, but the armed guard protecting God's presence within their midst. To walk the way of Jesus, it's about following God's lead and paying particular attention to God's presence within our lives. Think about that. Be careful to protect God's presence in our lives. Factor number three, again connected with the first two, Israel were then told to march around for six, day, for six days and also then uh, seven times on the seventh day. And through all of that marching, don't utter a word. In verse 10, I love this. A little kind of throwaway, don't say a word. Because their word was not important, per se. Only at the end of walking around Jericho seven times on the seventh day were they instructed to raise a shout. Here's the point. The Israelite army did not win a fight at Jericho based on their own might. Nor did their words contribute to their winning at all. I mentioned the kids' song earlier, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. No, there was no battle. There was no fight. Just one word uttered. The word instructed by God. Andrew was so keen for us as a praise team to be singing one song today. And so we decided to do it directly before the sermon. Let all the people say amen. Perfect song choice. I can just hear Israel all being told, let's shout the word Amen. A word that means, let it be so. As if the whole nation is saying, God said it is his will, so amen. May it all happen according to your will and your will alone. Factor number four, they were told to destroy everything within the city except the silver and gold because that was to be taken and put into the treasury of God. Now, I've got to be honest, I find this part of the story a little bit confusing. What's going on? Well, I think to understand it, we almost need to jump ahead to the next story, where we hear about Achan, who keeps some of the treasure that he uh, was able to find in Jericho for himself. And because that uh, treasure is in the tent of Achan, when they go to their next battle in the city of Ai, Israel loses. Achan steals some of the silver and gold in Jericho and keeps it for himself. Keeps something of value or perceived value so that he could now have it and use it to provide for his needs or his family's needs. Can you see the connection here? The people have been trained to live for the past 40 years in utter dependence on God, on God's provision for them. That required them to be totally obedient to him, to trust him. And in one false swoop, Achan decides to take care of himself. Achan's sin is about him looking after self-preservation. Think back to the story in Exodus chapter 16 when some people collected more manna than they were instructed to. What happened to it? It rotted. So the silver and gold in our story <clears throat> being collected and put into the treasury to belong to God is actually an act of God to say, I'm going to protect the people because they will be too keen to keep something of what they think is of value for themselves in self-preservation. Now, any minister who thinks he or she can preach on money or finances to a congregation that pays their stipend is, of course, walking on thin ice. But I think we have to be aware that one of the most precarious aspects of walking the way of Jesus 
is our innate nature to provide for ourselves. To not give God the first, the best of ourselves, our lives. Why do we think Jesus teaches more on money than perhaps anything else in the four Gospels? Perhaps because Jesus knows that money is perhaps the greatest hindrance for someone walking the way following him. Because as we walk, we can so easily rely on our money, on what we can do to provide for ourselves, that even though we say we're trusting in him, really, we're trusting in ourselves. Which leads to factor number five, verse 18. Keep away from the devoted things that people are told so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to the or destruction and bring trouble upon it. <clears throat> when I read that verse, I had to ask myself, why would this nation be under any chance of destruction? God's people had has trained them taught them, nurtured them for 40 years. Why would there be any risk that they might end up being destroyed? I think this all relates back to some previous text. I've already mentioned the Deuteronomy 7 passage. They're told, the people are told, do not make a treaty with them. Um, don't intermarry with them. Why? The text says, for they, the Canaanites, will turn your children away from following me and serving other gods. If you, if you let your children intermarry with them, they will end up turning your children away and for them stepping off the way of Jesus and walking another way. What I want us to hear in these verses is something that we hear repeated over and over and over again throughout the Torah, throughout Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, is that the ways of the world have a lure on God's people. They can pull us away from the Jesus way. When I became a Christian in my teens, one of the things I heard people talking a little bit about was the word backsliding. Youth, you know, being taught, well, you have to commit your life to Jesus. And once you do, now you have to do everything possible to not backslide. Because for whatever reason, you could end up backsliding away from your faith. Here's the point. Walking the way of Jesus, I think, is a precarious journey because there are dangers along the way, pitfalls, junctions, that can draw us away from Jesus. And we have to become aware of that in our own lives. It might be work, money, sex, power, sport, leisure. We have to be aware that if we negate the rituals and practices that we're being taught to undertake, the spiritual disciplines that God is gifting us, if we negate those, we could end up backsliding and being led away from the way of Jesus. And we end up walking according to the world. Five factors so far, and then we're going to do the last two together. Number six, number seven, patience and perseverance. I mentioned earlier my sense that God was showing his mercy in the delay of overcoming Jericho by giving them a week, six days, and then that big long seventh day. I want you to think about that rhythm from the perspective of, of Israel themselves, the people. What were they thinking as they were being told, this is how you will overcome this city? After the exodus out of Egypt, Israel wandered in a wilderness for 40 years, 40 years of learning what it meant to be God's people, being taught to be patient, being taught how to persevere. 
They were learning over 40 years a new rhythm of life. Patience that the promise that was given to them would one day be realized. Perseverance that the promise was within their grasp if they could learn to live in accordance to God's word. That whole idea of following God and you will be prosperous, you will be successful, you will be filled with life. And then after Moses gives his last speech, everyone I'm sure is getting kind of anxious and prepared for the next big move. They can see the Jordan line before them. They can, under, they can almost see that the realization of the promise is about to happen. Then they cross the Jordan. And what's the first thing that happens after they cross the Jordan? The supply of manna stops. For 40 years, they've been coming almost every night. Well, six nights, and then that kind of double whammy for the Sabbath. But immediately they cross the Jordan, the Israelites are now free to eat of the produce of this new land. God's promise is right there for the taking. They can literally taste it. Forty years of being patient, of learning perseverance, and it's now right there at the moment. But there are significant obstacles before them, namely all those that are already inhabiting the land this massive city of Jericho with its huge walls. But they're there. They're on the way now. They've crossed the Jordan. They've learned to be patient. They've learned to persevere. But they are ready to occupy the land and begin to prosper. So they cross the Jordan. They're eager to overcome. They've probably got dressed, ready for the fight. And Joshua is told, now, every man that's in your army, circumcise him. An incredible moment in the story. Joshua is told in chapter 5, verse 4, all those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, they have now died in the wilderness. A great little phrase. Joshua is basically told, all the army, that was an existence that came out of Egypt, all the fighting men, all gone. So what's the point? Well, the only people who are kind of capable of fighting against this, these new inhabitants or these inhabitants of the promised land are all your new soldiers, young men who were born in the wilderness. Those young men who are young and strong and able and courageous and eager to get going. They are indeed a formidable force. Joshua, consecrate every single one of them. Perform an act upon them that will put your entire army in the hospital for a lengthy period of time. And by the way, you've already crossed the Jordan. You're now camped within sights of them. You are now vulnerable to attack. We get told in verse 8, they remained in their camp until all of the men were healed. Everybody was eager to cross the Jordan. They were eager to get going. They were eager to start setting up home in this land flowing in milk and honey. They were eager to see God's promise being delivered to them. And now all of God's people are now thrust into another period of more patience, more perseverance more trusting that God will indeed provide for them. God is going to watch over for them, watch over them. God's going to take care of them, that their obedience to God's word will ultimately lead to the promise being fulfilled. And then when they're all healed and they're ready to go, all got their weapons on, got their armor on, Joshua says, okay, walk around the city once, but don't say a word. Go to bed. Get up the next day, do the same thing, and the same thing, and the same thing, and the same thing, and the same thing. Now on day seven, get up early, have a good breakfast, because you're going to walk around the city seven times today. Talk about patience and perseverance. And then, Joshua says, now raise a shout and watch what will happen. The way of Jesus is a journey of continuous patience, 
trusting in God's work, persevering in faith that we are indeed following God. How good are any of us really at doing that? Eugene Peterson, in another of his fine books called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, says this, quote, one aspect, one aspect of world that I have been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that everything worthwhile can be acquired at once. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. Religion in our time has been captured by the tourist mindset. Religion is understood as a visit to an attractive site to be made when we have adequate leisure. For some, it is a weekly jump to church. For others, occasional visits to special services. The world has a passion for the immediate and the casual. And then Peterson goes on to draw out that the Christian life, walking in accordance to the way of Jesus, is not a call to be a tourist, but in fact a pilgrim, a disciple, someone who walks along obedience in the same direction. A journey that requires patience, persistence, perseverance through trials, commitment to the word and God's calling upon our life. The way of Jesus is not a sprint. It is a marathon, to say it that way. A marathon of being patient that God knows how to rebuild us, what we need, how that's going to happen. Perseverance to trust, but by living in accordance to God's word, following a new rhythm of life, it will indeed lead us in that long obedience in the same direction to life. The Christian life requires us to steadfastness, to not get distracted so that we would backslide away on another path. I really think the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho is one of those key stories for God's people to hear, to learn from about what the Jesus way is all about. God's people were invited to cross the Jordan, not to survive. They were invited across to enter into a land to thrive. But the people had to follow the instruction. The question is, will we? Let's pray. Father God, we do indeed thank you for this incredible story. I pray by your mercy and grace that this story of Jericho would come alive in us. For your glory's sake. Amen. Please join us in standing once again. Planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God be first for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Run and hide. 
Digging deep to, to know, know our Father's, Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, can we first for more of you? Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to go. God, you made us to thrive. You're calling us onto your way so that we would indeed thrive. You've called us onto the way so that when we go forth from this place week after week, we would be stepping into a promised land, a land full of darkness, but yet we have the light. Help us to be that light. Help us to walk the way of Jesus. Help us to not become distracted. Help us not to backslide, but to thrive for your glory's sake. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit fill us with life overflowing today and always in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please hang around for some fellowship in the hall after. Uh, be good to kind of uh, uh, meet and greet um, everybody. So, and then we will meet again next Sunday for worship back here at 10. God bless you all. of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteously being restored. And those are the days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. 
still we are the voices in the desert crying in the desert way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's here to believe, and out of Zion till salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones become in his flesh. And these are the days of the servant, David, rebuilding the temple of faith. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the plow. Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of silence till salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah, 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 there's no God like Jehovah. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's near and to believe, and down in silence till salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call. 